uh, we're gonna have um, so we're gonna have uh, the papers presented in the order that they appear in the website. So uh, do we have the first speaker here? So the first paper is uh, Deep Genetic Learning uh, via uh, Euler Particle Transport. Seems like that we are missing the author. Um, uh, yeah. The first author is Yuan Gao, and I don't, I don't see him in the. Okay. In the Maybe episode. in that case we can we can start presenting the others, and if uh, if the author yeah. afterwards um, we can, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, let's start with the with the second paper then. Uh, so this is adversarial robustness of stabilized neural ODE. So we, we are also missing the second author? Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we can um, we can roll the yeah, we can roll until we go we find yeah. the author here. <laughs> okay, let's try the third one. I don't know. Well, I know uh, Stefan is here, so he yeah. can present his paper. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Give me one second to find the. Um... the photo share it. I'm sorry, I did not expect to speak so soon. Um, all right, um, so thank you so much. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I was going to speak about uh, a phenomenon that was observed last year uh, empirically and try to explain it a little bit. Namely, neural networks are wonderfully successful and great uh, and expressive, but it is often hard to understand how information is processed throughout the layers of neural network. And today I was going to speak specifically about the final layer, the output layer and the penultimate layer and try to uh, understand a little bit what's going on there especially in neural networks for classification problems. And so the observation that I'm going to talk about is from an article by Papia and Han and Donahoe. And uh, they realized that if we've got neural networks and we train them using cross entropy loss to classify data, then uh, the, uh, then basically, in the, uh, we've got the output before the last linear map. So the penultimate layer, um, uh, there the, uh, pre, uh, the output of the previous layers maps all points in one class of data to a single value yi in the long time training limit. And those points, those output, outputs in the penultimate layer um, have the same distance from every other output and the scalar, uh, scalar products do not depend on uh, the classes either. So in other words, uh, the previous layers map all the points in one data class to a single point and these outputs in the penultimate layer are located at the vertices of a standard simplex in a high dimensional space. And uh, the, this was observed empirically on a lot of data sets. So the question is, why does it happen theoretically? And we start with uh, 
uh, with considering the final layer and then we'll talk about the penultimate layer in the next step so if we've got any classifier h in some hypothesis class and then we uh, take a class of data ci and we just average it so um if we look at finite uh, finite amounts of data this would just be a normalized sum otherwise it's a normalized integral so uh, we make sure that every data point in the same class has the same output of the classifier then this reduces the risk the cross entropy loss of that classifier obviously in most hypothesis classes this averaging operation would take us out of the class however if we've got to the class of uh, functions which are merely measurable as or unconstrained features in the parlance of the field um, then this averaging operation does not take us out of our hypothesis class and um, in this case if we map into a convex compact set then we know that this replacing the outputs of our whole hypothesis class with the average actually reduces uh, the risk so in this case we uh, we know that specifically if we've got an lp ball we can write down the minimal uh, the minimizers explicitly because we're looking at cross entropy loss we don't have minimizers in the whole space so this is why we restrict ourselves to these balls now if we uh, have a classifier which is a composite of a measurable function and then a linear function then uh, where we constrain the output of the uh, measurable function and we constrain the operator norm of the linear function then we can show that there uh, there exists a unique minimizer which is the product uh, of the linear map and the uh, measurable map and the measurable map is constant on the uh, on the classes of data points the points yi form the vertices of a standard simplex in a very high dimensional space um, and the uh, because we constrained everything to be normalized around the origin the center of mass is the origin and finally um, the linear map is an isometric embedding of this k minus one dimensional space which contains the the simplex into rk so uh, the, uh, so in the high dimensional space there are all sorts of uh, rotations that can go on however um it, we embed this isometrically and then the minimizer in the end is unique so what does this tell us about uh the phenomenon that the authors observed so if we've got an incredibly expressive hypothesis class it is best in some sense to collapse all data points to the vertices of a standard simplex this argument obviously is not related to optimization algorithms at all or neural networks necessarily uh, everything that uh, we said in the first part is true for general hypothesis classes but in the long term limit of uh, optimization that is when we expect to see these minimal configurations so that uh, so then that is when we expect this to be meaningful um everything we did was based on norm bounds and so this may, uh, suggests that it may apply when it is easier to change the direction of an output than its magnitude so that the norm bounds are meaningful um the final layer geometry everything was general for lp balls in the penultimate layer where we uh, looked at what happens before the last linear map euclidean geometry seemed to play a role because uh, if we've got a subspace of a euclidean space we can rotate it and nothing changes in the geometry but the lp norms have a much smaller group of isometries so uh, this seems to be important somehow and we conjecture that this may be because the 
uh, because the optimization algorithms that the authors used in the ex in numerical experiments were based on Euclidean geometry, namely, um, we typically use radial Gaussians and we use SGD, which is based on a Euclidean inner product. Um, we can we also showed, and this is in the paper, not in this presentation, that for shallow neural networks, there are situations where a single point uh, collapse does not occur even in the output layer, namely if the input data is not linearly separable and the networks are quite small, or when the data is linearly separable and uh, the networks use ReLU activation, because uh, then under certain conditions, we've uh, got convergence to maximum margin classifiers and the maximum margin classifiers can be written down explicitly in some cases. And those are typically not constant over output classes because ReLU grows beyond all bounds. And so uh, the interesting part would probably be to go back throughout the layers and see whether we can understand a bit better how data becomes more and more linearly separable as it propagates through the layers. And especially here we see that if the, uh, because for shallow neural networks, it does not become linearly separable. It, 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 does, not, uh, it does not separate to single points if it is not linearly separable two layers before the output, it might suggest that this is a really good thing if we could understand it. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll have the questions at the end of the session. Uh, now we have Sebastian Moraga. Hi, thank you. I'm just trying to share the document. Um, so, sorry for that. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Sebastian Moraga. I'm a PhD student at San Francisco University, and today I'm going to talk about uh, deep neural networks that are effective at learning high dimension even value functions from limited data. So this is joint collaboration work with uh, Ben Adcock, Simone Burjapalia, and Nick Dexter. Ben is a professor at San Francisco University, Simone a professor at Concordia, and Nick a postdoc at San Francisco University. So the real thing what we want to do is to approximate a function that is a hybrid value function from its evaluations and on m sample points. Um, these points uh, y1 to ym comes from a parametric domain. And usually you have the input at these parameters, you put it in a black box model and you have the output like a uh, quantity of interest. We want to approximate what this black box model can do. So for example, uh, the main motivation that we have is a parametric PD. So given uh, some parameter Y, this defines a uh, uh, PDE uh, through a um, linear operator, like a differential operator with some boundary conditions. And uh, we want to approximate the solution of this parametric PDE by using <clears throat> some of the methods that I'm gonna talk about. So one of the methods is deep neural networks. Um, of course, everyone here is familiar with neural networks and we have seen a lot of presentation with them. Um, just to introduce, we want to do is to set up the parameters for the input of the neural network. And at the end, we, with the output of uh, this network, we can use that as uh, the input of an approximation. So as a general, we have the W's, the whites, uh, B at the biases and sigma the activation function that in this case, the most common would gonna be the ReLU activation function. So why are we using deep neural networks? Well, in the last couple of years or last 10 years, uh, deep neural networks have shown that they're capable of efficiently approximate functions from a variety of classes, smooth functions, these white functions, and HK functions. So there are existing theorems about these neural networks that approximate holomorphic functions. Um, as well, this can achieve the same error bound as the best S term polynomial approximation. And 
specifically they can obtain an error that's proportional to the exponential decay that we can see in most of the compressed sensing type of setups, where, for example, this gamma could depend on some region of holomorphy. And as well, we can control the size and depth of these neural networks because they are bounded by this term S or the dimensional T. In, as a main result of our work, it's that we found that if you have uh, some function that's holomorphic in a suitable region, we can show that there exists a type of neural network, for example, a ReLU neural network, a uh, type of loss function that we can use, a choice of these M samples, such that any network that is trained in this way, uh, given some sample points, we can have this error bound. The first one being the approximation error that quantifies as well if it's approximated by uh, the network in terms of the sample complexity. The second one that can measure the uh, error in the point-wise evaluation of the function. And the third one, that is the discretization error. Because I didn't mention this, but in the, the paper, you can see that we are not working in a normal setting. We're working with uh, B is a Hebrew uh, space. So in order to work with this space, we have to discretize it. And this induces an error because of discretization. But we can control that. And at the end of the day, what we see is that all this approximation can be bound by these three terms. Uh, as an numerical result, as a quick view, we try to see what happens if we try some uh, different loss functions, for example, the mean square error, or try to put some part of the problem into the loss function as an energy norm, as a loss function. And we, what we can see is, for example, using the mean square error in the coefficients of at the end of this neural network, uh, leads out to a better performance, actually. Uh, you can see that most of the cases in the right hand side plot, all the points that are below correspond to a mean square error. Um, what I've seen here is the testing error in the Lebeckin and Bochner norm. And an outcome from this is what this neural network can achieve is a very good performance in terms of approximating this function in the testing error. Uh, in some cases, they can outperform a little bit uh, the standard compressor sensing um, theory that is developing this way. And um, yeah, it's we have very good results, but we want to do a little more research in terms of if what happened if we change the loss function or what happened if the problem can be a little bit more uh, complicated than, for example, a simple diffusion equation. So yeah. Uh, I think that's my five slides highlights. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll leave the questions until uh, the end. And now we have Tom, I think. Do you hear me and see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. So uh, my name is Tom Tiller, and I present my work with uh, Johan and Raja on kernel-based smoothness analysis of residual networks. So basically, we all know the huge uh, uh, performance leap that uh, was obtained was obtained by the deep residual networks ResNet compared to the more classical multilayer perceptrons. And the uh, key ingredient in ResNet is the, skip, is the skip connection, where basically in each layer, uh, the features are the sum of those features of the previous layer, plus some nonlinear residual block, where here we have a hyperparameter alpha that in the original ResNet work was just set to one. But there are some recent uh, empirical works that show benefit of using smaller values or moderately attenuating this residual block. And there have been different uh, uh, or many works that try to uh, explain the success of ResNets, uh, but almost all of them focus on the optimization advantages of ResNet compared to MLP. And basically we observe another distinction between these models, even when both of them has perfect optimization, meaning that they are interpolated data. Basically, we saw that for uh, ReLU-based models, 
ResNet tend to promote smoother interpolation than MLP. And smoothness is an interesting property as there are several words that connect it with the generalization. So basically, here are just few experiments of the one that we present in the paper that show what I mean by the smoothness behavior. Basically, we see here practical models, each of them with the L uh, equals five non-linear uh, non hidden layers, and each layer with 500 neurons, with typical initialization, typical optimizers. We can see interpolations of uh, MLP in blue, a uh, ResNet with alpha equals one with orange, and ResNet with alpha equals 0 0.1 in uh, black. And we can see here that the curves of the uh, MLP are less natural and less smooth than those of ResNet, especially when you moderately attenuate the residual block. So we try to provide some explanation for this behavior, and we choose to do it uh, using the neural tangent kernel approach, which was all, all, uh, also discussed in earlier talk today. Basically, it's uh, a significance compared to other kernel method is that uh, under appropriate conditions, it can characterize the training of deep neural networks with gradient descent. So basically, we obtain the Gaussian uh, process kernel, which is required to compute the NTK and the NTK themselves uh, uh, for uh, a resonant model that we considered. And uh, I do not present the results here, which are quite uh, contain quite complex uh, formulas. They are similar to a uh, uh, result that were obtained by another work that considered slightly simpler uh, resonant model, but we also prove uh, stability of the resident NTK during training, which was not proved in uh, earlier work. And this stability theorem is uh, uh, has implications for the smoothness uh, comparison that we try to do between the ResNet and the MLP, because it not always say that from this theorem, we not always uh, 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 only get the uh, stability of the NTK itself, but also we can bound uh, each of the weight matrices, the spectral norm of each of the weight matrices. And this allows us to get, even for finite yet large white N, uh, upper bounds on the input output Jacobians of the two models. I just want to know that this upper bound still, uh, there is the square root N uh, that is not controlled in them, but it's not surprising because uh, we prove under my condition that the, uh, also in the NTK regime, the network can fit with zero training loss uh, any uh, training data, so we cannot bound the slope of its output, but we can try to examine, for example, the ratio between these bounds and get something like this. Again, I did not talk too much about the other parameters because I did not present the mathematical models, but here we get uh, with typical values for all the other parameters except alpha, we get this expression that from which we can see two uh, properties that we already saw outside the NTK regime. The first one is that uh, when we increase, when we decrease alpha, we get smaller bound for the ResNet, uh, which implies uh, smoother, uh, smoother interpolations, but all, we, we get it already with moderately small alpha. And with such values, values of alpha increasing the number of players further increase uh, the distinction between the smoothness of the models as can be seen from this uh, expression. And all the things that we saw outside the NTK regime, we also see them with experiments with the NTK. Basically, these are the shape of the kernels. Again, in blue, it's what we get for the MLP and the other colors for the ResNet. And we can see that both the kernels themselves are smoother and the interpolation and the distinction increases with the layers. And we also had a quantitative uh, measure that I yeah, did not, due to the time limitation, I did not present it here, but also uh, show this smoothness distinction. So basically, while we all know that the NTK is 
simplification of the deep residual uh, of deep networks that not always teaches everything about them, it did capture the uh, effect of attenuating the residual block and this difference between the smoothness of the circulation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we have uh, Romain. Uh, he's he's going to present the uh, deep autoencoders paper. Yes. Hello. Uh, okay. Can you see everything and hear me properly? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Okay. okay. Great. Santino, and uh, this is a joint work with. Tell you okay, there is a mistake. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry, my Zoom is actually crashing, so I don't know what's happening. Okay, is it okay now? We can hear you. Yeah. Hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so yes, I'm Romain, and so this is joint work with Randall uh, Balestriero. And what we try to do is to give some understanding about uh, autoencoders. So in particular, what we try to provide is a geometrical understanding of autoencoders. And then we try to leverage uh, this uh, understanding to provide some generalization guarantees. And in particular, we develop specific regularization so that the autoencoder map uh, reflects the data geometry. So an autoencoder is a pretty simple architecture. Uh, it is composed of these two modules. So on the left, you have the encoder. The encoder is taking the input data, x. So here we have a, a digit. And it is transforming it by a composition of linear and nonlinear map into this latent variable z that is usually of lower uh, dimension than the input data. And the decoder is trying to reconstruct the input data based on this latent variable. So usually you train this architecture using some kind of least square loss function. And what you hope for is that the Z latent variable will capture the salient features of the data. So then you can use the Z for unsupervised type of analysis, such as you can plug this latent variable as the representation of the data uh, into a k-means algorithm, for instance, to, to perform clustering. So the point of view that we, we took in order to understand this autoencoder is that we exploited the fact that they are, most of the common uh, modern architectures are continuous and piecewise affine. So concretely, what does that mean? Is that if you take this two-dimensional plane here and you plug an autoencoder, the autoencoder will induce a specific partition of the two-dimensional space. And what is interesting is that, so these are all the regions, right? Different color denotes different regions of this partition. And what is interesting is that if you go within each region, the autoencoder map is a simple affine transformation. So if I go into this orange region, and let's say I have multiple data points there, then the autoencoder map is just a simple affine transformation, and we have access to the analytical formula of the affine transformation. Now, if you go to another region, you have another type of affine transformation. And of course, this different affine transformation depends on the activation nonlinearities throughout the, the network. So now, if you go into this input space of higher dimensional data, not this two-dimensional plane, but if you go into um, like the Cypher 10 or MNIST input space, and you plug a deep network onto this space. And then you try to understand, okay, how many data do I have in a ball? And how many regions do I have in a, in a ball of a specific radius? And what we observe is that regardless of the data set and regardless of the architecture, the number of regions is usually much higher than the number of data. So what does that mean concretely is that Basically, uh, only few of these regions, so only few of these affine transformations map, uh, will have will contain data. So only few of them will be actively trained. So you don't have much control over the entire shape of the manifold, over the entire uh, mapping of the autoencoder. 
And so what we propose is a way to regularize uh, the entire shape of the manifold so that all the regions, so all the maps, are in fact um, controlled and not only the one that contain training data. So basically our aim is to understand how we can control this region uh, by a regularization that reflects the geometry of the data. And in, in this work, what we propose is uh, to assume that the data lie on the orbit of a group. So here I give you an example of the orbit of a group. So this is the orbit of the digit seven with respect to the rotation group. And basically by imposing uh, this kind of assumption on the geometry of the data, we can reflect this assumption on the geometry of the O2 encoder by a specific regularization. And so if you get this notion of equivalence between the symmetry what, that you have in the data and the symmetry that you have in the output of the auto encoder, then you can show that you have some nice generalization property. Uh, all the details of the mathematics, et cetera, in the P paper, I invite you to, to check them. And yeah, thank you for listening to my talk. Thank you so much for your presentation. So uh, do we, let, let's double check again. Do we have the uh, offer for the first paper, Deep Generative Learning here? Okay. Uh, and also, do we have offer for the adversarial robustness paper? Okay, so uh, if that's the case, then maybe we can start our dis discussion session earlier. Um, so thank you again for all the offers for the very interesting presentation. So maybe let me start with a more general question and then we'll go into more specific questions for each of the talk. So uh, in all the talks, um, the highlights that we've listened to, um, I wanted to ask each of the offer to comment on how your work contribute to our understanding of how network could generalize well, or what's the implication based on your work to, um, to you know, explain the generalization property of certain networks uh, architecture or certain you know, data distribution. Thank you. So, uh Maybe I'll, uh, I'll try to answer this first a little bit. So I was curious, uh, I was very curious about this because the neural collapse phenomenon when it was first observed was also considered as a positive result in generalization because um, the networks are observed to have reasonably good properties if, uh, if you then, um, replace the classifier with a classifier that just takes a, a, a test data point and looks where, which center of mass the output is closest to. Um, but then obviously our explanation is that um, the geometry that is observed is optimal in a class of measurable functions and measurable functions do not generalize at all because they are well entirely unconstrained. So um, I feel like uh, I feel like it it raises more questions than it answers probably, but uh, that was that was definitely one of the things that was very interesting to us, and I am very sad to say I don't think we've got a good answer for that. Uh, very quick follow up, uh, Ben. Do you have? that other future work direction to plan to exploit, like keep exploring this surprising result? Or do you think you should switch to maybe another explanation, like not continue looking into this neural collapse phenomenon to try to explain the generalization ability of the network? So I think the, the thing that probably strikes me most is that what we observe is, um, what we observe is that the, the phenomenon that we see is optimal in a class of measurable functions, not necessarily neural networks. And so um, the, it's possible, 
that uh, the uh, that th there is an interplay with the data distribution. That means that we uh, that the hypothesis class that we are observing is expressive enough to behave optimally on this particular data set, but it's it's not. Uh, if we were to uh, do it with a random data set, then uh, maybe it would not, uh, maybe we wouldn't observe the same things. I think there is a lot of, um, uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of things that I would like to test empirically before hypothesizing what the exact, what the exact causes are. Um, and I think that, and then trying to go backwards through the layers and trying to understand a little bit how the data is brought into more separable configurations would be really interesting future projects. Thank you. Um, other authors want to comment on that question? Feel free to jump so, in. Yeah, I guess I can go next. So regarding the generalization property, so in, in the case, so it's really different because we don't do classification, right? And so in our case, the aim was to say, okay, we have a specific surface, a specific data manifold, and how can we enforce this autoencoder to approximate it? And basically the observation was, as I mentioned in, in the small talk, is that most of the regions are actually not directly controlled. They are trained basically because of the sharing of the parameters because of the continuity constraints, but you don't have an active controls on the shape of the output manifold from the autoencoder. So what we were saying is that, okay, so one way to control it is to add this regularization that will not depend on the training data, that will just control these regions and, and the, the, the mapping. So in this specific work, we use this uh, group assumption, but I believe that this can be generalized to any type of structure uh, and that the same work can be done using just a simple uh, geometric assumption on the data and to transpose it into a geometric assumption on this region. And, and from that you can, because you have analytical formulas for the um, affine transformations, so each region has its own affine transformation, you can kind of easily derive some uh, generalization result thanks to this formulation. Yeah. So I think that would be the answer. Thank you. Uh, a very quick follow-up. So you mentioned the key is to add regularization based on, say, your data distribution uh, assumption, um, if I understand that correctly. So can you also remark on, so in practice, how one might say, if I want to add some nice regularization to my unconstrained autoencoder based on my empirical data set, are there, you know, implication for what's the best practice in real data cases? So in our case, we took this Lie group assumption. And so we assume that the data they lie on to the orbit of a group. So they are all transformation of each other, which is obvious, uh, not the, the case in reality. But because, so also the, the regularization is not uh, exactly the one that is assumed on the data, right? The real data symmetry you will still add some regularization onto this um, older region. So I guess we'll add some kind of smoothness. So it will help to improve the, 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 the reconstruction guarantees. Uh, now, uh, I, I guess you could do the same using, if you have a graph structure with your data, I guess you could use this graph structure the same way that we use this group assumption. So it really depends on the data set, but what we've shown is that in, in terms of results, we apply the algorithm for a bunch of data set, images, time series, and also the data are known to not be uh, lie on the orbit of a group. Uh, what we've shown is that it is outperforming the other traditional uh, autoencoder method. So this kind of regularization, I think, helps to flatten a bit the manifold and to constrain a bit more the architecture. Yes. Thank you. So we have other authors want to jump to that more general question in terms of generalizability. Uh, I can uh, give uh, uh, my uh, two cents here. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, in our work, we saw that there is 
a difference between the resident architecture and plain MLPs beyond optimization. Uh, so uh, the smoothness difference actually, clearly it has something that will affect the generalization. The question is, is that it's not that ResNets are as smooth as, like, let's say, a Gaussian kernels or something like this. One limitation is that we still use the NTK regime that where the features uh, are not learnable, but rather fixed in advance according to the architecture. So we are not sure that we uh, capture the whole difference uh, between the ResNet and the MLP, but at, at least from what we saw, in the NTK regime, we do capture such a difference, but it's not something like a huge, uh, like again, the, the difference between Gaussian kernel and let's say uh, ReLU MLP. So I think it's, there's like a unexplored area here that can be tried to under, people can try to understand to, to what, uh, uh, to what amount the 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 uh, features that are learned with ResNet are different than those that are learned with MLP, and maybe try to quantify this difference beyond the NTK, where the features are not actually learned. So, yeah. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Uh, so. Okay, now let's go through some more specific questions for each of uh, author's work. Uh, so I had a question for Sebastian from John. Uh, can you comment on the road of DNN architecture as a function of the input output Hilbert spaces? Yeah, no problem. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So what we tend to do is approximate the function, right? That takes value on the parametric domain and goes to a Hilbert value, let's say H01, for example. And the role of the neural network is because at the end of the day, this function can be expanded in polynomial domain and the Hilbert value can be discretized with final elements, for example. Uh, the, the physical domain can be uh, expanded that way. So this function is expanded in two ways, one with uh, polynomials and one other with uh, finite elements for the physical domain. So the role of the neural network is giving this input, this, param this parameter, what we can do is to approximate the coefficients of the expansion with the output of the neural network. So we feed this neural network with the parameters and at the end, they give us the coefficient of the finite element expansion in the case of the parametric PDE motivation. So if in any other case, you have a function that can be expanded with um, another type of coefficients, sure, give us the parameters. And at the end, it, if you give us the coefficient of this uh, expansion, uh, that, that, will be, that will be the role of the neural network here, like doing that, that process. Is that clear or should I, is that okay? Th does that answer yes, your question? Thanks. Yeah, uh, I'll dig into your paper uh, afterwards. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we also have a question for Stefan. Uh, so can you uh, can you give us the intuition of what happened as we cross the boundary k equals m? And also, um, do you have a any sense on the optimization landscape and the role of the depth in this theory? Okay, that's a lot. <laughs> okay, um, so for the role uh, for boundary k is equal to m, so ba uh, basically you would have, uh, I guess that would be a penultimate layer that is thinner than the number of classes into which you are trying to classify. Um, I did not look into that, but there is an article by Jan Feng Lu and Stefan Steinerberger where they uh, where they look at that. And um, if I remember correctly, then you get basically uh, uh, well, you uh, they have slightly different normalizations. 
So um, for them, they've got Euclidean unit vectors and uh, essentially those try to be as spaced out on a high dimensional sphere as they probably possibly can be. So I think if you imagine that you've got a just two dimensional layer, then you would try to have equispaced dots on the circle and then try, uh, then you can always try to project into the uh, direction in, a, in an extremal fashion. And in the uh, higher dimensional case, then you uh, have a higher dimensional version of that. And um, the details, uh, I would refer you to John Finger and Stefan Steinerberger. Uh, about the optimization landscape. So um, I think the unconstrained features are meaningful from an energetic perspective, but not from a dynamic perspective, because uh, we know that how you parameterize things is actually really important because we know that linear maps are not the same as linear neural networks. The dynamics are very different. So I think what we were looking at as a positive result to say that this is in some sense optimal is very much not related to considerations of, of optimization. And so uh, for, for measurable functions, even the geometry of the space, or what distance do you use, et cetera. Um, for, Neural things that are parameterized as neural networks. We uh, we uh, did have the negative results where sometimes you can just compute that uh, that the uh, optimal geometry is not attained in the limit because uh, for a neural network uh, because in uh, in some sense the uh, there are no uh, there are no minimizers of cross entropy. And so the, for the neural network, it is better to just keep increasing the magnitude of the output and not actually collapse everything in a single task to a single point. So there must be some interplay also between, I guess, the geometry of the data and the geometry of the neural network that we've not captured. Yet. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so if there are other questions, we should, um, uh, ask them in the chat and maybe the speakers can answer them online, uh, offline. Uh, so finally, let's, I'm going to end the session by having the talk by Yuan Gao. Um, uh, and, uh, and after that, we move on to the next section. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I would like to introduce our recent work on deep generative learning with tools from Optimum Transport. Uh, we named uh, uh, our work uh, as deep generative learning via all our particle transport. Our, the name of our method is uh, all our particle transport. This is based on joint work uh, with uh, uh, Professor Huang Jian from the University of Iowa, Professor Zhao Yuling, Professor Li Shiliang, Professor Yang Zijian from Wuhan University, and Professor Liu Jin from Duke NUS Medical School. Okay, let's start with the general learning. Generative learning aims to learn representations of probability distributions from target data. There are two types of general learning. The first one is to directly represent the sampling precise. Uh, the other one is to represent a uh, probability density function. And the general, deep general learning uh, refers to general learning with deep neural networks. Our motivation is to learn a transport map to represent the sampling process from target data. And our solution is to uh, use omni transport and the green flows. As indicated in the figure, that given a unit uh, uh, Gaussian distribution, we would like to find a transport map that is parameterized with neural networks. 
so we can use this transfer mark to uh, trans to transform the samples from unit Gaussian to match the distributions from uh, true true data distribution. That is to make the generative distribution uh, match the uh, data distribution. So we will need a loss to mire the discrepancy between P between the generated distribution and the true data distribution. Then I would like to introduce some uh, background about the on the transport. Uh, given two probability measures, mu and nu. Suppose we can sample D from mu. Then we can uh, we can call T a transport from mu to nu if the push forward map of mu under the transport map T equals to uh, the target distribution nu. Uh, Kondorovich uh, introduced a relaxation of mass problem that is defined by the uh, uh, optimization problem in equation one. The optimization is uh, uh, is defined with respect to the uh, couplings of marginal distribution mu and nu. Suppose these two distributions has have densities q and p with respect to the Lebesgue the Meyer. Then the Kondorovich problem in equation one admits a unique solution. Gamma. The solution gamma is defined with the with the gradient of function psi, and the the, the gradient of psi satisfy the Monzampe equation as in equation two. To find the optimal transfer of t, it is sufficient to solve the Monzampe equation. However, this equation is difficult to solve due to the high nonlinearity of the uh, one minute left. Okay, of the determination operator. So we use the uh, linearized method. Uh, the linearization will lead to the Markin Lasov equation, as in equation four. We also use the afterwards as the discrepancy to measure the discrepancy between mu t and nu. So we can choose the velocity fields vt defined as a, fun a gradient of the function of uh, the density ratio rt. Next, uh, we will use the Euler method to find the, to decrease, decrease as the um, making velocity of equation. So we can find the uh, final transform map as a, a composition of the circuits of uh, same simple residue maps. Then training the uh all our transfer maps uh leads to uh find the velocity fields. So we uh turn this problem into uh estimation the density ratios using Brigman divergence. We we uh we realized that this algorithm with uh uh, deep neural networks. So, uh, the final the final map the final training map is uh, T hat as a composition of uh, simple uh, resonant maps. This is uh, uh, our our proposed method. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we thank all the speakers that we had this session. And um, now we move on to the next session, which is chaired by Marilu and Elias. Thank you all, the speakers in this session. Okay, thanks, Thank you. Soledad. Uh, so, th this next session will be about high dimensional statistics.